Mr. McGrady, thank you. I appreciate uh, your comments there just in reminding us some of the daily uses that uh, I think we all take for granted there uh, and the vulnerability that we have. I I'd like to start off my questions uh, this morning um, uh, focused a little bit on, on oil and uh, specifically to the oil export ban. Uh, it's been uh, a couple years now, um, 19 months exactly, since we lifted the domestic ban on, on crude oil. Um, there was a lot of discussion at that time about what may or may not come about uh, were we to roll back that, that policy that had been in place for decades. Uh, there were some who said nobody's going to want U.S. oil. Uh, there were those that predicted that the price would, would skyrocket if anybody did actually buy it. But instead, what we have seen uh, are, are prices that have, have been relatively moderate, uh, even as our exports have now topped over a, a million barrels a day uh, just in some recent weeks. So um, I, I guess I would direct this to, to you, Mr. Webster, and, and to you, Mr. Mills, in terms of, of uh, where we are with the opportunities that we have as, as an oil exporters and um, the, the international benefits that then come to it. Uh, Mr. Webster, you, you certainly referred to that. But uh, again, there was a lot of speculation that there was going to be uh, not a doomsday scenario, but uh, that, that uh, that some of the fears that had been talked about were going to materialize. Now, 19 months perhaps is not uh, enough of a test case for us. Do you see this moving forward in, into the out years uh, in terms of, of stability of prices and, and, again, just the opportunities that come with um, developing these alliances with, with other nations that are eager to receive our oil? Mr. Webster. Uh, thank you, Chairman Murkowski, for that question. And uh, uh, thank you for, I know you worked on this issue quite a bit when it was when it was coming up. I remember your speech at the Brookings Institute some years ago uh, to kind of We dared off. to <laughs> raise the issue, and yes. lo and behold. Uh, I, will, uh, I will answer your question on has there been enough time. I think there actually has been enough time that this has been fantastic for US producers, US consumers, and the concerns that this would really hamper U.S. refiners and cause them to stop investing and there would be a real loss has, is belied by the recent EIA report that refinery capacity in the United States has actually grown uh, again. And so this is despite the, the view that, you know, the, the concern that some had at the time that we'd be exporting our, our resource and, and, and leaving us in a, in a worse spot. We're exporting, as you said, more than a million barrels a day at times uh, to as many as 26 countries uh, per the EIA. Uh, prices and the, and the differentials that are required to allow exports but still allow refineries to uh, take on that, that oil have been there. And so you have seen a lot of oil go uh, in other places. The interesting thing is that it has given both domestic and international refiners a greater range of choice. Refineries don't just use one particular type of oil, and so they can now more tailor make their slate of oils, and that's why you're starting to see actually an increase in crude oil imports back into the United States as they are blending that increased production out of the United States uh, crude oil, which is quite light, as you know, uh, and blending it with other sort of um, uh, material from other from other countries. This has been a, a benefit in that this extends uh, U.S. production to other countries, and obviously, uh, at least in my opinion, any oil that comes out of the United States is generally more stable than just about any other sort of sort of oil in terms of that uh, going forward. So I think it's been extremely positive. Mr. Mills, do you care to comment? Let, let me uh, agree with Jamie, and, and also uh, thank you for your leadership in this. It was. Uh, those of us in the community who thought we should export oil were, uh, seemed to be a minority even on, on both sides of the political aisle for quite a long time. I think it's unequivocally the case that the experiment of 19 months has demonstrated the benefits overall uh, for consumers everywhere, not just in America, where we've helped stabilize the world. Uh, I think, let me answer the question about what could, what could be done next, where could we go? I think we have untapped opportunity to do far more uh, we're now a larger exporter of, of crude than five OPEC 
nations, or four or five OPEC members. We could become one of the largest, by, by that I mean North America, one of the largest exporters of both crude and natural gas in the coming decades. This would be astonishingly impactful and very beneficial, not just to our security, but to our economy and to the world, because we play a role in, in not only stabilizing prices. We're now, in effect, half of the throttle. It used to be OPEC was the entire throttle on oil prices. We're, we now we have, uh, we have our hands firmly on the wheel and the, and the one foot on the gas pedal as well, which means that oil prices are going to be range-bound in the future by American behavior. We could change the game, not just by helping the shale industry by getting out of the way, so to speak, but there's a lot more to be done yet. I mean, I'm saying the obvious to you, but when you think of the combination of what Alaska can yet do and has not been unleashed to do, what the Gulf of Mexico is just starting to do, and the new leases that, that the, the nation of Mexico has uh, granted to foreign entities to begin producing from the shallow waters, uh, the very productive shallow waters uh, that, they, that they own. If we add to that the rest of the Atlantic coast and the other conventional deep water capacities we have which are getting better, this combination of the United States I think is reasonable to think in terms of not just increasing a little bit. We could double, triple, and quadruple our exports of oil and natural gas. This, this is profoundly impactful. And it doesn't mean, I mean I'll state for the record, because when, you, when one is bullish about oil and gas, the implication is that one doesn't think that we should pursue alternatives to oil and gas. The reason in my opening remarks I pointed out the realities is the realities of what they are. Airplanes in the world fly on oil, and they will for a long time. Most cars, even if Elon Musk is an astonishingly successful, even more successful than he's already been, most cars will still burn oil 20 years from now. The world needs lots of oil and gas. We can do both, and we can generate the economic foundation for doing the alternatives by having cheap energy in the primary areas. And that's, that's where all the United States, and in particular, unleashing that trapped uh, oil that I'm very familiar with in, in, uh, in Alaska that needs to get down in that pipeline and get into world markets. Thank you both. Senator Cantwell. Thank you.